Good morning, Bishop. How you doing? Doing well, sir. Doing well. I'm blessed to be here on this morning. And uh, uh, it's in your hands. All right, Bishop. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for that introduction and that prayer. We appreciate it. Every day we rise, it's a great day to be alive. And the Seven Cities, Seven Cities Forums of Hampton Roads presents Portsmouth Coffee Talk. And I'm here today with my host, of course, Leo Drake Stitt. Good morning. Thomas Stephano Chapman and yours truly, Good James. Good morning, host. Good morning, James. Good oh, morning, Slim. Salute. Give it up, give it up, give it up. <laughs> we have coffee, talk with all coffee. Now, if yeah. you drink coffee, you don't have coffee in it. <laughs> Make sure, you know. You raise your cups to us. For some reason, and, my cup, maybe because, maybe because I'm left-handed, I think my cup is, is just turned the wrong way, you know? Okay, <laughs> you. But make sure it's the right way. Make sure people I know. I know it. <laughs> All right. Good morning, everyone. And, Good morning. And, uh, this morning, well, we starting out, this is the first day of November. <laughs> yes, of it is. And we all here. <laughs> That's yeah. so great. But anyway, we're, we're starting off the month of November. Of course, the no month of Mo November is National Adoption <clears> Month. <throat> we start off uh, this month. And later on this month also, it's, it's veterans. We're going to honor the veterans as well. But today, we're going to start out with the National Adoption Month and something that's close to me, being a, an adoptee uh, myself. And we have a special guest with us uh, this morning, Tracy Hewitt Hobson. Good morning, Tracy. How are you? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Tracy. Yes, Tracy. Is, are... Tracy is a former Portsmouth resident, and yep. she went to Mount High School. And well, yep. uh, congratulations, Mount is back on the scene. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. The mighty Mustangs. Yes. <laughs> and she attended Virginia Union University and Texas Texas Southern University. Mm -hmm. And of course, I got to mention this: a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority. And yep. he's here with us this morning uh, because she is also an adoptee. And uh, not yep. only an adoptee, she is a Korean orphan. So we're going to get into that a little later, or how that's connected. But uh, Tracy, I'm glad you're here this morning. And um, uh, you're in New York, of course. And you, you live in California, so you didn't have to yep. get up as early as you would if you were <laughs> joining us in California. But still early. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> It is a little early, but it's all good. Anything for you, Slim. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. You know, anything for a panther, right? That, exactly, exactly. I am that very humbled are, by the invitation. Thank you very much. I'll just move on. Enough said. Uh, how about them cowboys? Okay, we'll move on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, Tracy, uh, again, we're glad to have you here and uh, joining us, especially on this special show about adoption. And uh, you have a very interesting story. And uh, what I want to do, I want to start, you, you grew up in Portsmouth and yeah. uh, you were adopted. And, and it, you talk about adoption, you know, uh, at some point early on, it used to be, uh, used to be a little stigma behind it. Uh, most people, a lot of people didn't know, myself being one of them, that they were adopted. And a lot of times it was situations not to get into that because of what uh, the environment the person came from. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, that probably was my case. Uh, but uh, it seemed like uh, back in the day, you know, it was like a, adoption wasn't the word that you mentioned, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, But you were a little different. You knew from the offset that you were adopted. Your parents uh, let you know that you were loved twice mm -hmm. uh, when you were exactly. born, when they accepted you into their life. So, but uh, even though you had that, that acceptance uh, from your parents and they were open with you about your adoption. Uh, talk to us a little bit about 
coming up in the city of Portsmouth uh, and, and being involved in schools and everything, and although you were adopted by your parents, looking a little different, how did the uh, students accept you? Did you get those, you know, uh, what are you, uh, or did, did you just blend in with everybody? How was that coming up to high school? We'll start with high school first, well, in the community. High school. Uh, I, you know, I have to admit, I did always know that I was adopted. I um, always knew I was a little bit different. Um, really struggled um, a, a, a lot, especially through high school, because I was so different. Um, didn't know how to navigate that. And I don't think that those around me knew how to navigate it either. But I did get the typical, what are you? You know, where are you from? Um, got called a lot of names. Um, everything from Chinky to Jap to... Um, and, and the strange thing part about it was I was neither Chinese nor Japanese. I was actually <laughs> Korean. So uh, it, it, it was tough. It, there was trauma there. Um, I don't think anyone can fully understand the impact of that, um, how much it's carried with me through my life. Um, at the same time, though, it made me very strong. It made me resilient. It made me able to um, just take a lot. Um, but it, it was there were some very tough times, very tough times. Picked on because I was different. I'm excluded <clears throat> because I was different. Um, a lot of assumptions made. Um, it, 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 it was tough. Didn't have a lot of close friends. I had two very, very, very close friends who I'm friends with today. Um, but yeah, it, it was tough. You know, Tracy, and, and you grew up in an environment, in a, a culturally black environment. And did, uh, were you exposed to your Korean, Korean heritage early on or, and, and later on um, we'll get into you know, your journey as far as that's concerned, but early on, were you exposed to your Korean heritage? My, my father, I was adopted into a military family. My father was in the Air Force. My father tried very hard to keep me close um, to that culture background, um, always instilled in me to be proud of it, regardless of what was going to happen. Um, I think that he realized, I think both my parents realized that I was going to have a tough time because of it. My mother, not so much. My mother did not necessarily emphasize it or try to be sure that I stayed close to it. My father, definitely. Um, and unfortunately he passed um, actually my freshman year in college. Um, mm. So I do appreciate him keeping me close. Um, everything from cooking Asian food periodically, um, to just talking about it, you know, bringing me um, books, um, you know, dolls. I, I, he he did try. And you know, uh, unfortunately, and before, the other, before the other host getting here, I just want to go and in, step into your college years. And you know, we talked, you know, a few weeks ago. And what surprised me because you know you came to Union. Uh, I think you like two years behind me, or maybe three. Mm -hmm. I remember you coming to Union. And I was surprised that you said even there you might have had some some issues with, with with some students, which surprised me because even though we were predominantly black, we had some uh, other cultures there, and I did not mm -hmm. see. Usually, we are more accepting than other races are of, of, of people who are maybe. And I was surprised that you had some issues there. Uh, talk just a little bit about that. I, I know the union experience was a great experience, but you know, it, it was some times that you really had to, to uh, go within yourself to find strength even there. I did. Um, if it had not been for, you know, Wilberta of course was my roommate and she was a godsend because she um, really stuck with me, uh, Pell Seaton um, really stuck with me um, because we grew up in Portsmouth together. And if it had not been for my sorority sister, um, I, I really would have, I think I would have probably not stayed at Union. Um, and again, I, you know, what I attribute it to is people don't necessarily know how to navigate different. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I didn't know necessarily that it was okay to, um, what's the word, um, communicate how proud I was of being different. I was, I was taught to kind of suppress that. And, and I think that's where the struggle came from. So I, I, as much struggle as I had 
uh, looking at the on the other side of it, I also think that folks just they didn't know how to approach that different. I didn't know how to communicate that it was okay. Um, so I think it was a struggle for both sides. Mm -hmm. Definitely. The other host, if you have a question. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Tracy, uh, were you mm -hmm. adopted in Korea or here in the States? I was adopted in Korea. I was adopted in 61. I was four years old when I was adopted and then lived in Tokyo, Japan for a little bit before I came to the States. Uh, and when I came to the States, I could not speak English. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, I've lost the Korean language, um, which is a whole nother <laughs> uh, issue for me. Um, so always knew I was adopted. It was never hidden. Mm -hmm. uh, my extended family, uh, my adopted family, they love me to death. I love them to death. And uh, it, it, from that standpoint, clearly I was very much loved. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. And it carried uh, me. Yes. I need to do a little bit of housekeeping first right here okay. and uh, need to put the disclaimer out there. The views that are expressed on the show are not of the radio station, but of the host and our guests. So I need to put that little disclaimer out first. And then the other piece is I, I need to also uh, pay some bills also. And as to tell the people out there in electron land, if you'd like what you hear and you want to hear more of us, uh, you can send a donation or a sponsorship letter to uh, or check to uh, P.O. Box uh, 7664, Portsmouth, Virginia, 23707. And so now that I've gotten the housekeeping piece out of the, uh, out of the way, uh, Tracy, what, what you're talking about and what, what struck me is about when you talked about the uh, growing up in the military, and I uh, also grew up in the military background, and what you're sort of describing there is your military heritage, where I think you're having uh, more people of uh, mixed races and mixed cultures and everything are thrown in what I call the salad bowl, and it's more accepting than more so than out here in the civilian sector. Do you, you, do you agree with that statement? Totally agree, totally agree. Yes, um, yes. When I used to live on Langley Air Force Base <laughs> in Hampton, um, very different experience living on the base than to your point out in the community. It was a very different experience. Mm -hmm. Yes. For that and, exact reason. Right. And, and you know, and, and so also if you arc back to, uh, I think you said 75, 73, 74, 75, when you were at Union, uh, and what I'll call back in the old days, you know, times were different. And what uh, you growing up as a uh, biracial, mixed cultural person is now the norm. And it, and, and it, is. It, is, it is now the norm. And I think that is one of the problems today. And I'll say it problems because it scares white America. And uh, that's why you'll see some of the culture wars and mm -hmm. politically across the nation where uh, we're staring up because we've mixed, you know, young folks have mixed and they don't want to see that anymore. And it harks back to the case of... Uh, you know, when they had the first black and white married here in uh, Loving, in Loving, Loving, Loving case. Mm -hmm. And uh, now that is the norm and it's really scaring the, what I call the, the grand old party. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, it, it's just bringing back memories now. And so, uh, but I'm glad you persevered and in, in, in progressed and gotten through this. Mm -hmm. And now you're a shining example of what, was and what can be today. Absolutely, absolutely. And thank you for that. Um, I agree with you. I think it's a whole nother world today. Uh, but at the same time, I still, even today in corporate America, um, still have incidences, if, if, if you will, occurrences mm -hmm. where um, I still have to stand up for myself and learn to stand up for myself um, and be proud of being different. Um, my kids, interesting enough, even though they came through the 80s and 90s, um, have had to protect them in some instances. Um, mm -hmm. Very recently, um, for the same reason that they were uh, 
that's how it's it for being different. Um, and luckily for them, they never, they never flickered. They never, they were always very proud and said, yes, I am um, multicultural and I am biracial and I am proud of it. Mm-hmm. Um, will not ever deny either side. Um, and that's the one thing I'm grateful for is that I was taught never to deny either side. Mm-hmm. Be proud of both. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you spoke earlier about the fact that you, uh, one thing that you regret is that you've lost your language. Uh, have you made any attempts in trying to learn your, your language? I, um, I am now. Um, I went back to Korea in May of this year. I spent about six weeks over there. Um, it was my first time returning um, since I left mm-hmm. in 61. I went for the sole purpose of doing a birth family search. Um, and I talked with a lot of when you go to Korea and they have government agencies that specialize in adoptees. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and you, the, one of the first things that they do is they have you speak with, um, I won't say therapist because that's not necessarily the right word, but just to make sure that, that psychologically, mentally, you understand what's behind the, the, the push or the pull mm-hmm. of adoptees. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that we talked about was um, I realized that I was, it was very common across the adoptee community that we were all very angry that we had lost the language. Mm-hmm. And when I spoke with uh, one of these counselors or these therapists about it, they said the anger comes from the fact that somebody took something away from you and you had no control over that. Right. And so Mm -hmm. um, it it, it was very, very. And, and when that was said to me, it was like, Oh my gosh, that's exactly it. I was frustrated Mm -hmm. that I could not pick up the language quickly anymore. Mm -hmm. I was frustrated that it was like, I was supposed to know this should be ingrained in me. And it was a a block. It was a Mm -hmm. mental block. Um, I'm getting a lot better. I am learning, uh, relearning (laughs) the language. Uh, my children have picked it up. Uh, mm-hmm. My youngest one, of course, speaks it fairly well. She's not necessarily fluent, mm-hmm. but she, when we were in Korea, she definitely <laughs> had enough to navigate us through. Okay. Um, and, it, and it was, it was tough in Korea, you know, because immediately they look at me and they immediately speak to me in Korean because they, right. Um, and not be able to respond to that. It was very, very, uh, it was embarrassing. It was frustrating. Uh, it was very overwhelming. Now, how successful were you in, in your in your search? Um, you know, what's really interesting is we got very, very, very close. Um, I found um, the orphanage, actually, the site of the orphanage, the original orphanage. Actually, met with the granddaughter of the owner of the orphanage. Um, found some paperwork. We got very close, um, but have not found my mother's family. Um, at the same time that I was doing that, I was also hired a private investigator in the U.S. Mm-hmm. to help me out with my father's side. I had much more, I have located my father. Um, and within the last few weeks, I uh, realized I have two sisters, mm-hmm. um, a large, large extended family um, have actually, they have reached out to me. Uh, we keep communicate and one of the reasons I'm on the East Coast is I am going to meet them for the first time. Oh, um, wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. So, and your father yeah. is still in Korea. No, my father was um, also military. He's in the okay. army. Okay. Uh, my father, All right. Yeah. Um, uh, my biological family, he, my father, he was in the army. He passed actually in 1980. Okay. Um, but uh, he was in Korea. He was stationed in Korea uh-huh. at the time. So, yeah, I did find out, interesting enough, I thought that I was adopted as a baby or uh-huh. was in the orphanage as a baby. I did find out while I was in Korea that my mother actually, um, I was with her for a couple of years before I was put in the, in, in the um, orphanage. Um, the history of that is just, it's really painful when you mm-hmm. delve down into the history of all of that. So. And did your father know that you had been placed in an orphanage? He did not know. I did not know. Uh-huh. Did not know. Um, I have found out in talking with my family. Um, I'm sorry, it gets, it gets a little melting. I know, a little bit I raw, can imagine. But, um, yes. 
I did find out from my family, though, more recently that they have all said um, consistently that if he knew I existed, he would have come to find me. Yeah. Um, wow. Um, and one of the first things interesting my sister said to me when we actually revealed, when the PI actually revealed that we were related, that we were sisters, one of the first things they said to me when we were on a Zoom call um, is they apologized to me. Mm-hmm. And that meant so much to me. Yeah, yeah. Um, they apologized for, and it, you know, again, it was nothing in any of our control, mm-hmm. right? Um, um, but they apologized for the struggle. They apologized for it having taken so long. Mm-hmm. Um, they apologized for um, just not knowing the family, and that meant you. I cannot describe what that meant. To yeah, me. yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, well, such tra- an amazing tra- story. Tracy, you know, I I feel you. I feel you. And uh, I knew before you came on, it was going to be kind of emotional uh, once you start uh, getting into it. So uh, that's why I doubly appreciate you coming on and and talking about it. Uh, uh, I always felt like talking about issues in your life is is therapeutic. Uh, Mm -hmm. It is. is. And you can help others that might be going through the same thing. Mm -hmm. What I want to uh, ask you about now, you went over to Korea and found out about the orphanage. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was the interesting uh, like story about that orphanage? That uh, there were uh, children there that were adopted out all over the world. And all over the world. Interesting story you had with meeting other people uh, from that orphanage that uh, you're looking at them and they had the Korean face, but they were <laughs> speaking perfect German, perfect uh, <laughs> French, French and things like that, but uh, right. all new English. All of them uh, knew. English was their second language. Um, uh, met a Russian. Uh, that that was probably the most, um, I won't say disconcerting, but really, really interesting. Spoke perfect Russian, perfect Russian accent. Uh, English was the second language. Uh, from France, Italy, Norway. Um, one of the adoptees that I met from Norway had actually been adopted twice mm. um, and ended up in, in, in Norway. Um, their first language was wherever country they were adopted out to. Their second language was uh, English. There's, in all cases, if they spoke Korean, it was their third language. Mm. And none of them, very few of them, um, actually spoke fluent Korean, which I thought was very interesting. Mm-hmm. But they all live in Korea. Well, that's that's amazing. Uh, that that part about being adopted twice, because how special is that? With you have a lot of uh, orphans that age out of the system mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. without getting picked up at all. Uh, one other thing about that orphanage, uh, with with the uh, children being adopted all over the world, was it something going on at that time that uh, was maybe profitable for? you know, that to cure the children. Why so many orphans? Was it because of the war maybe, uh, which created probably a lot of the orphans? Mm-hmm. And was it something that was profitable for the country or the orphanage to adopt these children all over the world like, like what's going on? You know, it wasn't, it wasn't profit at all. Um, I am considered uh, what they call a first generation adoptee um, from the Korean War. Uh, as the aftermath of the Korean War. And basically, Korea is a very proud country. Mm -hmm. Um, And at that time, it was all about purity. Mm -hmm. Um, And they wanted to get rid of anything that reminded them of their struggle, um, anything that would indicate that they were no longer pure. And so they wanted to get rid of the orphans um, not rid of them, that's, that's really a bad word, but they wanted to um, just kind of um, casually just get them out of the country, adopt them out. Um, and so many adoptees, Korean adoptees, um, they, to this day, they don't necessarily know that they're adopted. You know, mm-hmm. some of them could be adopted into Korean families mm-hmm. uh, globally. Um, um, I did find out that there's over 80,000 Korean adoptees that have returned to Korea to mm. live mm. Um, after having been adopted out all over the world. Um, beautiful stories of reunitement. Um, like I said, in Korea now, 
um, they want retribution for what they did to those, those orphans. And so mm-hmm. they do have a branch of the government. That's all they do is try to reunite families. Um, mm-hmm. So, and, and it's a process when you go to Korea, when you sign up for this process, if you will, um, it's very, very intricate. Um, mm-hmm. Everything from, they have their own DNA database for adoptees. They have their own um, um, missing children, if you will, uh, database. Um, it's very intricate. Um, one of the first things that was funny to me when I went to Korea is I had to file myself as a missing child. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. And I am not a child. <laughs> uh, um, I mean, you know, milk carton flyers, the whole thing. It was, it was a very intricate process. Uh, yeah. I, I thought um, that was interesting when you said uh, the, still the milk cottons uh, are still <laughs> fire, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, You know, you talk about what happened with the orphanage and that same thing happened with Vietnam uh, orphans. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, I guess culturally, uh, it, it, it was important to them, uh, you know, for the race to be pure. I, and, and, and it's not only something that happened in Korea, but <laughs> in Germany mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and other places. Mm-hmm. So Everywhere. Was yeah. The fortunate part of it, a lot of those uh, children were adopted into families and, and uh, lived productive lives where mm-hmm. they might not have otherwise. They stayed where they um, were. You're actually right. In Korea, I give them props because they recognize what they've done, not only um, to, the, to, to these children, but um, also themselves they understand that that all of these children they sent away if you will are very proud to be korean Mm -hmm. and so they have embraced all of all of us um um, you know their thing now is if you claim us we will definitely claim you Mm -hmm. so um, i definitely give them props for that um and the fact that that the Mm -hmm. government supports that Mm -hmm. you know and the one thing that you said uh that uh in korea they maintain their own dna database do they share that database? Because I know I had a friend who recently did uh, Ancestry.com for her family. Mm-hmm. And when she did Ancestry.com, she found out that her father-in-law had a child who was Korean. Oh, wow. Of which they were able to reunite after, oh my God. 40 50 years you know so um wow. i'm wondering does 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 um korea share their dna database with the sources such as ancestry.com they do not um i actually did ancestry and 23 and me and that's how i kind of got started my son actually um did 23 and me for me basically made me spit into that yes <laughs> yes too. but uh <laughs> And if it wasn't for him, uh, I would not have gotten as far as I did. But um, in Korea, this particular, when I got in touch with Korea and started the process, the first thing I asked him is, can I just send you my raw DNA file from 23 and Ancestry? And they said, absolutely not. Hmm. They would not accept it. They would not take it. They said, we will take it from you uh, when you get here. Hmm. Um, um, they, they, and this, this particular DNA database is not widespread for Koreans. It is only for the adoptee community. Mm-hmm. And so they keep it very, very tight. Mm-hmm. Um, their privacy laws are incredible. And that's why they do it. That's why they will not take it from anywhere else. Um, they don't want um, any, anything to be divulged that the adoptee or the adoptee family does not want divulged. So they're mm-hmm. very, very tight about that. Okay. All right. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, we took a, a family trip to uh, a couple of family trips pr- uh, pre-COVID, uh, and uh, one of the countries we went to is Korea. And I will tell you that uh, of the Asian populations, they're more, and I, I guess you could speak that, the families are more tight-knit than they are here in the United States. They will, the Asian families or in that cultural, all the cultural things from Asia, they will uh, go, to the, uh, go to the mat for a member of their family. They stay together, they, mm-hmm. they, they support each other. Uh, they start a business 
they support that business and then they mm -hmm. and they encourage their uh offspring to uh also uh get into the business or start their own business and and that is a big dichotomy of what you see in the african-american population where we're almost like the crab theory you got to get your own mm -hmm. uh, i would agree with that and, and that's that's uh for me, it's very interesting to navigate because um, it's the whole nature versus nurture thing, right? And I am very big on family. Um, I, uh, and my family is very close. Um, my, my children, um, they, are, they probably were sick of me growing up. <laughs> uh, um, I make sure that they stay together. I am very close to my extended family. Um, just, yeah. It, it is a natural thing for me, but I totally agree. I have seen on the opposite side of that. Um, some parts of my family have split, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Before we go forward, uh, I'm, I'm going to have to end the radio portion of our interview, and uh, we will continue on the Facebook Live portion of it. So I want to thank all the listeners on WGPL 1350 AM uh, for listening today. And make sure you come back next week where we're going to uh, honor veterans. And our special guest is going to be special. And I'll tell you, it's going to be one of our own, Thomas the Colonel Chapman. He's going to oh, be Oh, no. Am oh, I going wow. to have to interview <laughs> him? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we might get a few words in, um, but uh, we're going to try. But uh, you know, you don't want to miss that one either. So exactly. come back next week and join us uh, as we uh, get into the veteran part of this month. So uh, Tracy, uh, and, and just like, well, I, I guess all cultures are like this when you come down to motherhood, you are very protective of your children because even though they are all on Facebook picture wise, but they're known as DNA <laughs> one, two, <laughs> and three. Yes. Those ones yes. I've seen. Uh, her name, actual name, is um, uh, your daughter, who is who is, who is an actress. Act mm -hmm. But uh, and, and that's understandable. That's understandable. But what I want to get your know, trip back to Korea because I looked at the pictures that you uh, posted throughout mm -hmm. beautiful country, and and I guess uh, the colonel can attest to this by by his visit there. Beautiful country. I mean, uh, your first uh, impression of landing or, or, or the plane landing in there and seeing what you saw. I know that had to be an emotional period too, but looking out over that country and seeing how beautiful it is and um, experiencing it for yourself. Uh, talk a little bit about how that was for you. You know, um, my daughter actually gave me the trip as a gift, as a Christmas gift last year. And um, she purposely wanted to go in May because it's my birthday month. It's Mother's Day. Um, and my kids really struggled with my struggle. Um, and so she gave it to me as a gift. Um, we actually took a midnight, a red-eye flight out of uh, LAX, actually. And we arrived in Korea in the early morning hours, around 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the morning. Um, had to do our quarantine and all of that. But one thing that struck me was the country was very green. It was just, a, like you said, it was a beautiful country, just beautiful, um, clean, uh, no trash anywhere. Uh, they don't have trash cans on the street. Uh, nobody litters. Um, everybody is just very conscious of their environment very conscious of keeping their environment. And, and I think that's because the country was so poor for so long mm -hmm. um, that they are proud of where they've come from. Um, I remember stepping off the, the, as we're coming in for a landing, I was very, very, very overwhelmed and just burst out in tears because of the fear of how it'd be taken mm -hmm. coming back. Mm -hmm. um, and um, of course, did need to be stepped off the plane and was immediately embraced. It was just, uh, I just can't ever describe that feeling. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And, and I noticed too, one of the things you did when you got there, 
Uh, you got tattoos. Uh, uh, I did. You know, <laughs> I got two. <laughs> you got two. But uh, they were two. very meaningful tattoos. Yeah. The one with the magnolia, magnolia mm -hmm. bloom, which uh, yeah. had your Korean name. Am, am I correct there on it? You know, had my uh, Korean name at the root. Yeah. What, what is your Korean name? Uh, my Korean name is Moon Mi Hae. Um, so I chose the magnolia bloom because the magnolia bloom, especially for those who grew up in the South, magnolia is is the strongest, mm -hmm. most resilient tree. And so it symbolized that strength, that um, beauty, that um, resilience. Um, so that's always very important to me. Um, I, and at the root of it is my Korean name. Mm -hmm. um, so that I could always remember that that's the root exactly. of, of, of my strength, right? Mm -hmm. um, the other tattoo that I got was I went to the Korean uh, War Memorial, um, which I, I would say anyone, I don't know if, Karina, you went to, if you had an opportunity to go to the Korean Memorial where you were there when you were in Korea? Um, no, we didn't do the uh, memorial. Mm -hmm. Try to do everything um, good, but we didn't make it that far. <clears throat> I, I would tell anyone that if they go, to, if they ever go to Seoul, to definitely make a trip to that museum. Mm -hmm. They had a uh, an entire exhibit dedicated to the orphans of mm -hmm. that war, and one of the things that struck me was a um, uh, a quote from someone, and um, at the end of the quote, um, it was "Nonetheless, life goes on." Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was, that summed it up beautifully, mm -hmm. that nonetheless, life goes on, no, regardless of being an orphan, regardless of, um, you know, after adoption, that you can't necessarily dwell on it. Although, yes, it was traumatic. Yes, the trauma stays with mm -hmm. you. But nonetheless, life goes on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was the second tattoo that I got, actually written in Korean. Okay. Yeah. Well, well Tracy, uh, my sister-in-law is <clears throat> Korean. Uh, my brother was in the Air Force, and he married her over in Korea. Uh, mm -hmm. I have not had an opportunity to go there yet, but I told them I am going with them when they go. But it's one thing, my nephew, one of my nephews was able to go to Korea and teach uh -huh. over there. Yes. So, yes. so it's one thing that my sister-in-law has done. She has tried to maintain the language. Uh, with, within the family. And my brother speaks um, Korean. So um, it's, a, it, it's, it, it's such a heartwarming thing when you can embrace those aspects mm -hmm. of your culture. And that's the one thing that I'm very thankful for her for is the fact that although her children grew up here, she made sure that those children maintained that cultural base there in Korea. And the family, like you said, the family is very, very tight. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. uh, they, they've come over, uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, when we went to Israel, her sister didn't speak English, I didn't speak Korean, and her sister was my roommate, and uh, so we had to communicate with the, each other with uh, Maisha's mom and Jayam's mom, you know, but uh, mm -hmm. but the, the tightness of the family is very, very evident uh, within the uh, Korean culture, and um, Kudos to her for, for maintaining that. Um, I so wish, unfortunately, neither of my parents spoke Korean, um, but kudos to her for that. Um, mm -hmm. I agree. I think it's, I think it's a beautiful thing mm -hmm. to maintain both sides. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, cause to be stripped of one's culture, it just takes so much uh, from you. I know just in dealing with my native American, I call it my native American family because they adopted me into their family. But you know, with the way they did with the, the uh, American Indian side, it took some of the children away and put them into mm -hmm. orphanages and stripped mm -hmm. them of everything that they had, you know, just as they did with us when they brought us over here to strip you of your culture. Exactly. I, I mean, you have to get, you have to get back and, and, and get in touch with those cultural roots. Mm -hmm. And that's why my first, when I first was able to travel, my first thing that I wanted to do was to get back to Africa, get to Africa so that I could get a feel for the uh, where the people are and the language and the history of the people mm -hmm. from whence I've come, so that cultural mm -hmm. uh, a renewal is just is just so so very important, so extremely important. So agree, so agree, so agree. Um, and you know, people ask me all the time that why now? Mm -hmm. You know, and to your point, I don't think that the appreciation would have been there 
Right. Um, not that I didn't want to know. Mm -hmm. um, I have tried off and on for decades um, to do this. Um, but I think that now was the right time, to your point, to actually truly, truly uh, receive that. And to be able to appreciate it, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, I guess that follows if you don't know your past, you don't know where you're going to go. Exactly. So it boils down. That's your life there. Mm -hmm. You got to find out your past. So know. So in this part of your life and in your, mm -hmm. in your journey, so you'll know where you're going to go from here. Someone asked me to describe um, what the feeling was of being adopted and the struggle that I was having. They said, can you describe that struggle? And the way I described it was, if, if you take my life as a book, it is like that first chapter was ripped out and mm. missing. Mm -hmm. And to your point, I cannot make sense of the rest of the story because I don't know the beginning. Exactly. exactly. Um, and that's exactly. what, that was my driving force. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. wanted to put that first chapter back. Mm -hmm. And I didn't mm -hmm. feel I could write the ending to, uh, to the story. Mm -hmm. um, right. If I didn't know the beginning. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you know, Tracy, that's a, sort of a difference between you and I as being adoptees. Uh, for years, I didn't know. I really didn't find out until I was 21. Uh, a lot of other people knew, uh, but <laughs> I didn't know. But, uh, and it didn't, uh, one of the things that I went through um, at a very young age, having re reoccurring dreams, uh, mm. didn't know what they were. I just said, well, I just mm -hmm. dream the same thing every night. And after I found out, found out that they weren't dreams, they were memories. Mm. Memories. Being a little kid and, and talking them over with uh, my birth family, they came to life. I mean, uh, those dreams I had, I would talk about this. Oh, yeah, well, that happened. We did have chickens in our backyard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was kind of a, a, a relief there because those, those dreams immediately stopped, you know. Mm -hmm. and, but I, I, even at Union, I was having them. You know, mm -hmm. those same dreams. And it wasn't until after the union I really found out. So uh, it started but the isn't same. isn't that interesting how, how you ahead. hold tight to that? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I mean, I think yeah. it's just interesting that in innate in your nature was it was something inside of you that was not going to let that go. Exactly. Um, uh, yeah. And I think that's, that's just amazing. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Because I had an amazing uh, childhood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. family to this day I just having a, a broader extended family that, mm -hmm. that I know of, but, uh, you know so uh, it's, I guess we're similar in that way I, you know I, I just didn't know <laughs> that mm -hmm. I had that yearning with inside of me uh, I, I want to um, talk about go ahead go ahead go ahead Tracy no I'll say the opposite to that I had no memory um, and when I was in Korea I went through a hypnotherapy um couple sessions of hypnotherapy and try to go backwards to try to find that point that you were talking about um because I could not remember anything from the orphanage um so I I admire the fact that you held on to in the back of your subconscious mm. you held it um, so maybe, yeah um, something made me just block it out so. mm -hmm. uh, just for a minute I want to go back to Korea with you mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. uh, talking about the meals, and and, and you mentioned that uh, your parents <laughs> sort of kept that culturally that cultural experience with you growing up. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, I saw some of the eating. I saw that chicken <laughs> feet. I said, okay, that's that's African. <laughs> <laughs> then I saw a plate with something that was moving. Moving. <laughs> You know, uh, actually a meal or it hadn't been cooked yet. I mean, but uh, it, it actually was a meal. So in um, Korea, they had these huge fish markets, right? It's massive. And you basically go and you pick whatever you want fresh. And then upstairs from the market, there's these restaurants that you take it upstairs and they'll prepare it however you want it. That's just natural. What you saw was uh, one of the delicacies in Korea is um, octopus, small mm. octopus. And um, they literally chop it up live and they marinate it in like a sesame oil or, um, but they serve it to you literally like fresh out the water that way. Oh. Um, so it's still, it's still moving, it's Tracy. Tracy's still moving. 
it, it still moves. You touch it and it squirms. And I remember when they put it in front of us, they said to us, they said, okay, be careful with the tentacles because um, they sometimes they can suction to your, to your mouth or to your throat. And so <laughs> immediately when that, you know, what do you, what do you say, you know? Um, and we were with uh, my daughter's uh, PR team at the time. And because they're the ones that took us because they wanted us to experience it. And it actually happened to one of them. The one of the suction things got caught. Um, and of course they know how to handle it. You know, they get it where they can undo it, however, but yeah, it was still moving, still moving on the plate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna tell you. I, I did. Did you try it? No, I, I, I did try it I because it's rude not to. It is, it uh, is. So it's very rude. So my daughter and I both um, tried the smallest piece we could find <laughs> on the plate. Uh, but it was delicious. I have to admit, it was absolutely delicious. Yes. Uh, well, yeah. Tracy, but avoided those tentacles. <laughs> if I have a, a, invited to your house to eat, I'm just going to have to be rude. Uh, <laughs> you're just going to have to forgive me at some point. Because I saw that and I said, well, no way. Uh, I think I'll go a, a, a diet or something. I don't know. But anyway, but that, that was amazing. That was amazing. And I think uh, you talked about the closeness uh, of, of your family and your kids. And that was amazing. They probably, like you said earlier, they live with your struggle. Uh, mm-hmm. Even though your life has been amazing, but like we were That's talking, about, your mind, mm-hmm. and you just needed to complete some things, and they live mm-hmm. with you in struggle, even though they didn't have the same kind of struggle. Although I'm sure they experienced some things, they did, they did. Yeah, make sure that you completed. Oh, well, it's not totally completed yet, but you <laughs> started on that journey mm-hmm. to uh, mm-hmm. follow your roots. And I think that was uh, great of you. It, it was, and and you don't realize what your kids can see in you. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't realize um, how in tune they are um, to what makes you tick, what doesn't make you tick. And uh, I was extremely grateful that, <clears throat> uh, and we didn't talk about it, um, not until this, right before we did the 23 Me, that they expressed that they had, they had, they saw it. All, mm-hmm. all their lives and it mm-hmm. wasn't that I was ever sad or unhappy it wasn't any of that but they could they they knew it was just something and then they saw it they knew it so mm-hmm. it could be just a slight nuance of a response how I responded to something or what I would say but they got it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah kids they are uh well they know a lot more than uh and they already let you never know. Mm-hmm. But uh, mm-hmm. w- one fact I'd like to get through is for the listeners out there is when we talk about the sheer numbers of adoptions across the United States, <clears throat> as far as African-Americans uh, and uh, other populations, uh, whites uh, uh, are, are three to one uh, ratio for adoptions am- amongst Blacks to whites. And so our numbers are are Mm -hmm. smaller than Mm -hmm. the other two populations. And then the Hispanics are just a little bit on, you know, they're about with with, uh, blacks in there. So I'd like to encourage those out there, if you you can, to adopt those children out there because they Mm -hmm. need the family also. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. (laughs) Because it's strengthening our society. It does. Um, I was kind of an anomaly in the Korean community because most Korean adoptees um, are adopted out to, if they aren't adopted out to a Korean family, they're adopted out to white families. Exactly. So I was, mm-hmm. I was a bit of an anomaly mm-hmm. being adopted to a, 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 an African-American family. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I and, and if you talk to those adoptees, um, although they had some wonderful lives, the one thing that they will all say consistently is um, their culture was stripped from them mm. being in the, in that environment. Exactly, exactly. And at least, as you said, your father did make an attempt to uh, embrace portions of your culture and bring it to you. Mm-hmm. 
which was mm -hmm. a blessing within itself, you know? It was, it was. Can you make kimchi? kimchi? All I want to know is, can you make kimchi? <laughs> <Huh>? <laughs> I cannot, but I, but interesting enough, I have a cookbook. Um, there's like over a hundred different types of kimchi. Yes, indeed. Um, well, I, pref I prefer the cucumber and the cabbage, okay? <laughs> yes, yes. I'm with you, Leah. I'm with you. I love the cucumber and, and, um, and we do keep kimchi in my house. <laughs> uh, we keep we eat a lot of rice in my yes, house. Yes. Uh, so yes, I agree with you 100%. I will make what one of the things I looked for when I was in Korea, I wanted a kimchi pot. Uh -huh. I was not able to find one, but I'm going to, I'm going to perfect it. So the next time I come on, I'll be able to tell you, yes, I perfected it. And, and I'm going to come by and check it out because I have tried <laughs> all types of kimchi. So <laughs> Yeah, we have to see if you, I agree if you perfected you. the art. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I agree with you 100%. Um, yes. Speaking of food, because one of the big things in Korean meals are they do these side dishes called banchan, right? Yes. And kimchi is always a staple. Always. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. So as yep. long as kimchi doesn't move, um, <laughs> as long as it doesn't move. <laughs> It doesn't move, but, some, but some, sometimes it can be powerfully hot, though. Oh, Lord, <laughs> oh yeah. my goodness. <laughs> yeah. But it's a great probiotic. Oh, it is indeed. It's a health, it, it is a great probiotic. I usually have some in my house as well. So, mm -hmm. the only thing that should be yeah. moving on the plate at the table is this. <laughs> Not anything on the plate. <laughs> but I, I, I just joke about that. But, uh, you know, just speaking of your DNA and, and all your children are great. And, and I, I just want to mention, uh, well, you're in New York visiting your daughter. And, and for those who mm -hmm. don't know, you, uh, Tracy has a daughter that's uh, in the acting field and, and doing a mm -hmm. phenomenal job. If anybody familiar with Net, Netflix, uh, The 100, uh, which, is, which was a series, she was uh, prominent in that. Uh, she was in, uh, what's the Chilling Adventures of uh, Sabrina? Of Sabrina. Mm -hmm. And one thing mm -hmm. I, I got caught up in was watching that and, and saw her in there before I actually knew she was your daughter. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember thinking, you know, that they had one part where all of them were witches. And one of the things uh, in their culture of witches was to be sacrificed. That was an honor. And I said, oh, mm -hmm. no. She was one of the ones that were going to be sacrificed, and she was proud of that. And her character was proud of that. Mm -hmm. And I said, "Oh no, they're going they're going to kill her off." No, <laughs> but uh, she was convinced <laughs> to do that, and she continued in the series until the end, I believe. Right? Mm -hmm. She she was all the way to the end. So, yeah. Yeah. and and she's been in some other things. Uh, she's in a movie now. To, uh, tell the audience uh, what she's working on now. I, I think, well, the notice of it is out, so you won't be uh, spilling any. No, won't be divulging anything, though. No. Um, she's actually on season three of You, the Netflix show You. Yes. Um, she, That's a, um, the movie, I'm sorry? That's a weird show, but it's interesting, but it, it has me kept. <laughs> yeah, psychological thrill for sure. Uh, yeah. She just, um, the trailer for her movie just came out, Uncharted. Uh, with Mark Wahlberg and Antonio Banderas and Tom Holland. Um, that will drop February the 18th, uh, but the trailer's out now, I understand. I uh, got a lot of calls saying that they had actually seen it in theaters. So um, and she, right now in New York, she is filming um, a Netflix miniseries called Jigsaw mm. uh, with Giancarlo Esposito and um, Paz Vega and a couple of others. Um, so she's here for the next few months finishing that up so um she's done things for disney she's done things for nickelodeon so mm -hmm. very successful career she's only been in the business um about five years very short time mm -hmm. she's been very blessed very blessed yes some heavy hitters jay carlos was in uh do the right thing back then with spike mm -hmm. Lee. Mm -hmm. bad the guy that blew up in breaking bad <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, so she's in uh She's she's sitting there with the big boys. But, uh, she's yeah. in good company, huh? Yes. <laughs> she's in good company. Yeah. And you know, the one thing that we get all the time is she is nothing if you ever meet her in person. Mm -hmm. Um, one thing I'm very proud of is that all three of my children are very kind people. Um, they're very humble and they're very grateful. Um and and that's what I'm most proud about, all three of them. Um, but she is nothing like 
the character she portrays. Mm. Um, she has a uh, uh, her voice uh, in real life is very different than her voice in any of her characters, and that's the mm. first thing that people notice. Um, always, always bubbly, always um, just a lot of light. So mm-hmm. All of them have a lot of light. Yeah. Yeah, she she really gets some really strong character roles. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, in some cases, almost the villainous roles, uh, mm-hmm. which are, mm-hmm. most movies are the most interesting. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. and her thing is to make sure she, whatever character she plays, she's very adamant about telling their story mm-hmm. um, in the most authentic way, um, because she believes that each character has their own story that you may not see it on the screen, but they have their own story, mm-hmm. um, and she wants to portray them in that light and she's all about playing strong women um even in you um she's and she's done interviews about this where she went to the showrunner and she said black woman would never do that <laughs> she was real, real clear about some things yeah. uh-huh mm-hmm. yeah get the writers straight <laughs> and she did just, you know and the showrunner the took mm-hmm. her just the yeah. Yeah. But yeah, we appreciate that. And she, even uh, at her young, early career, she's, uh, I don't know if she started a production company, but she has, definitely has control over uh, the roles she picks and mm-hmm. certain things she would do on and on screen. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think, you know, that's, that's commendable. She's got an incredible team behind her. Um, her manager is actually from California. A uh, homegirl um, came out of the music industry. Um, would not trade her for anything in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, she has wonderful agents, wonderful. Uh, she's got a great team behind mm-hmm. her. Um, and they all listen to her, even though she's young. Um, they all listen to her because she's very clear about what she will and will not do. Um, so I'm, I'm extremely grateful for that. And Jigsaw is especially close to my heart because she will actually um, play uh, a Korean character so it's oh, really that will be very very special to me Ethan Jigsaw oh. comes out when it will come out probably late next year okay yeah. okay mm-hmm. so, yeah they're still in production uh, okay mm-hmm. and and one thing uh we forgot to mention that when you went to Korea they actually were doing a documentary of uh mm, of your journey and uh and you are a part of that which mm-hmm. is already mm-hmm. over there Will it come um, they, this way, you think? I um, I do not think it's going to... It was kind of interesting. It was a um, kind of a, uh, a fluke that that even happened. Um, when we went over, um, Tia's team knew that we were going. And so um, in advance, they let her team in Korea know that she was coming. Um, but she made it very clear to them that she would not do any work um, until we had gotten through what we needed to get through. And so her team there took took care of us, um, mm-hmm. basically. And the one particular gentleman um, that was the head of the team over there also has a production company. And he happened to mention to a um, the head of one of the bigger production companies in Korea um, that we were coming over, why we were coming over. And this gentleman had an epiphany. Um, Mr. Ko was, was sharing with us that he was in church, actually this uh, one Sunday and he had an epiphany that said to him, you have to tell her story. Um, and he went back to Hugh and said, do you think that she would allow us to share in her journey while she's here? So it was a total fluke, just mm-hmm. passing conversation. Um, Mr. Coe felt it in his heart that he had to tell the story. And so they assigned a production team with us um, that followed us. They aired the documentary there in Korea. They actually aired it um, we were actually on the plane back to Korea mm-hmm. and they asked us if they wanted us to, you know, stick around until, and I said, you know, it's okay. Just go ahead and air it. We're on the air back. Um, they did send me the YouTube version of it, um, but it aired on one of their major stations. It's very similar to like 2020, 60 minutes, that type mm-hmm. of, mm-hmm. um, um, uh, and they told my story. Mm. Um, it's got, almost half a million views already on 
um, YouTube, a lot of comments, a lot of feedback. Um, unfortunately, we have not gotten a clue yet, um, but I think it's coming. Uh, but that was that was very much an experience. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. Um, well, my daughter to... wants to. Yeah, my we daughter to... actually wants to. Go ahead. I'm sorry. So Go ahead, Tracy. Would you... Go ahead, Tracy. Your daughter wants to. She wants to actually um, do a documentary on this end, create, uh, do my story on film. She, mm-hmm. she does have a production company. Mm-hmm. Um, so she actually wants to tell the story. So um, it's taken me a long time to even talk about the story. So, mm-hmm. yeah. But in the process with your story, you can help others to heal as well. Who may exactly. not be who may not be as fortunate as you to be have been, been able to go to Korea, but at least it could be a healing process for them as well. You know, Leah, and that, I think that's what I've come to, to understand is that not to be so ashamed of my story, mm-hmm. um, if it helps somebody else, exactly. that it, can, it can be that healing, that healing point. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And so I, I'm very grateful that I finally had that epiphany, right? It's mm-hmm. just help somebody else. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, what a blessing. Yeah. What a blessing. And, and yeah. we really appreciate the, the opportunity <clears throat> on and, and to hear your story. I mean, especially growing into and have to navigate between what was going on with the uh, in, in growing up in a black neighborhood and what we were facing mm-hmm. African Americans mm-hmm. and having mm-hmm. that extra part of your, your mm-hmm. own heritage mm-hmm. mixed in there uh, with that. You know. No, no, absolutely. I mean, so many times you stand in the middle because you're not accepted by either, mm-hmm. um, by either side. And so um, that that was the hardest part coming through is trying to figure out where I really belonged. Mm-hmm. Well, so. you know, I told, I told you when you came to Union, you were just a homegirl from Portsmouth. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and that, that's all that matters. And, uh, that's that's all was- that matters. That's all, that all that matters. Do you still and have family in Portsmouth now? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, shout um, out to my your family in Portsmouth. <laughs> hey, Sam. How are you? <laughs> Actually, I'm gonna be I'm gonna go down and see them uh Wednesday. I'm gonna oh. go down to Virginia to see them. So my mom is still there. Um, lots of cousins. I, I so love um I have to give all my love to them because they have helped me through this journey. Mm-hmm. They have stood by me. They have encouraged me. Um, and they have never faltered in that. They've never mm-hmm. treated me any different. You know, I hear a lot of adoptees talk about that they've treated differently by their family. Right. Uh-huh. Um, my family has never, ever, um, not once. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I so, I so love them. I so That's love good. them. So not That's as good. close to my not as close to my adoptive mom. Um, um, and I have two brothers. I'm not as very close to them, but um, my my extended family, they are godsend. That's um, good. Yeah, they are godsend yeah. for me, for sure. So you know, I, I feel you there because I, I have the same love for my, my family and uh, mm-hmm. Colonel down there in the block. He's one of them. He's one of them. We... <laughs> You mean you okay. claim him, James? You claim you claim him, James? No. <laughs> we, we grew up together, and, and for for a short period, uh, he said he was an army guy. When they were traveling, and came back home to sell. They mm-hmm. uh, two brothers stayed here with us. You know, okay. you know wow. slept in the same bed. And I tell people now, we can't do that now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah. no, no. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's the family, the first family I know. And uh, mm-hmm. so I, I feel you. I know where you're coming from. Yeah. And, and never yeah. had any, any problems and, and never had any issues as far as that goes. You know, mm-hmm. and even the transition when I found out about my adoption, you know, that just went over smoothly as well. They accepted the, my birth family that, that comes down to visit every once in a while. So mm-hmm. it's like a blended situation. Mm-hmm. 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 So, you know, so James, how do you, um, because this is one thing that I think I'm still struggling with a little bit is to um, knowing that I'm actually a member of two families. Um, I, I think I'm still trying to process that I'm a, my biological family name is McElveen, right? And I'm a Hewitt on the other side. How were you able to kind of 
merge that. And you know what I mean? Um, it's thinking, oh, wow, well, do I say I'm a McElveen? Do I say I'm a Hewitt? Do I, you know, am I Hewitt McElveen? You know, so. Uh. <laughs> well, you know, it was, it was kind of difficult in the beginning because uh, I, I, I did not know, you know, my brother just came up to my door one day and said, hey, I'm your brother. And, uh, you know, I kind of knew something, but uh, then it had to be. And then I had to, you know, it was hard for me to sort of go to my family and say, hey, what's going on? And, and I actually did that uh, to my mom and, and dad, and it didn't go well uh, on that, that first time. And never really did, you know, it, it mostly went, it sort of came into play with other members of my family. Uh, my parents, you know, struggled with that. Uh, so James, your birth so brother I came. To... Your birth brother came to you before your parents told you that you had been adopted. Right, and, and I always think that at, at one point they probably, you know, because I was very young, and at one point they probably said, "Well, we're going to tell him when he gets to this age." Right. Then you know. I'm, I'm at Norcom. Next thing you know, I'm at, I'm at Union. Yeah. Uh, and, and it hadn't been done. And then all of a sudden, I come home uh, one day and say, hey, uh, let's talk about this. And they weren't prepared for that. Mm. And so I backed away from that. And then I kind of walked this tightrope uh, between the families. And then, um, you know, um, unfortunately, you know, they, they, they kind of, they passed away without us really settling that thing right. between. Right. Right. Mm. The rest of my family sort of embraced, uh, you know, uh, Tommy can attest to this, uh, the colonel, uh, embraced, you know, the whole situation, which made me feel better not having to mm -hmm. walk that that thin line. So it was difficult mm -hmm. at first because, mm -hmm. like I said, at, in some families, I, I think it was more protection of me because the situation I came from, mm -hmm. kind of crazy. And I had three other brothers and me being the youngest, I was, you know, the, the adoptable one. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. just talking to my brothers now, what they went through, I mean, being spared of that, I, I'm truly blessed. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, but after a while, it, it just sort of uh, uh, came to play when I started opening it up to, uh, to uh, my, my family, my family, mm -hmm. which I called. And I never really had to sort of say, well, am I... Am I this? Because I found out my, my birth name was Anthony Curtis Goodrich. Mm. So my middle name is James Anthony Overton. So they kept that. So everybody was calling me Anthony. So, mm -hmm. ah. so that's how I sort of, you know, blended in. And then when I got to Union, uh, the slim name came up. So that's... <laughs> <laughs> and it's dark. <laughs> yeah. Slim Goodrich, Slim Overton. So, you know, uh -huh. either way. But uh, it, it was kind of difficult at first, and it took some time, you know, uh, to really sort of feel comfortable mm -hmm. and know everybody else was comfortable about it as well. Mm -hmm. So you you'll get there, you know, you'll get there. And so, Tracy, you uh, said you're meeting your you're meeting your your uh, biological father's family this week. This week, so I you am, um, I have. But I'm sorry. Right. You've only spoken to them over the phone or over the internet or? I've only spoken to um, them over the, the phone. My sisters, I have actually had Zoom calls with them. I've had two Zoom calls calls with them. Um, but all the rest of them, I've spoken with them over the phone, um, were very welcoming, um, didn't doubt that I was part of their family. And interesting enough, when we first thought there was a gentleman that we first thought was my father um, in that family. And um, he had five children and there, those children actually called me, reached out to me one Sunday and we all talked and they said, well, we're gonna test and we're just going to confirm, you know, it wasn't that they necessarily doubted that I was related to them, but for all of us, we wanted to confirm. And it turned out that they were uh, actually my cousins. Mm -hmm. um, and not my siblings, but to this day, still keep in touch. Still, mm -hmm. you know, on Facebook, we, you know, we share stories with each other. And so I, I'm just grateful that they embraced me. They all, mm -hmm. you know, cousins in Atlanta, you know, Charlotte. Um, my one surviving uncle is in Huntsville, 
Alabama. So I'm really, really looking forward to sitting down and chatting with him. Um, I, I'm sure he can tell me everything I ever wanted right. to know. Right, um, right. Yeah, so, um, and interesting enough, my, both my sisters are AKAs. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> yeah, both sisters are AKAs. Uh, one of my cousins um, actually went to high school with my adopted cousins in Hampton. Um, just found that out. Uh-huh. So through this journey, we have learned all of these degrees of separation, these like very small degrees of separation. Very small degrees. Um, very small degrees. That's right. Um, um, so I, I'm learning a lot um, bit by bit. Um, and, and to your point, Slim, it is one thing my adoptive family all said when, I, you know, starting out on this journey, I was torn because I didn't want to betray them, mm-hmm. you know, so to speak. Um, and I remember sharing that with, with one of my um, cousins, actually more like my sister than my cousin, but um, was telling her that I was just, I didn't want them to feel like I was turning my back on, mm-hmm. on them. And the one thing that she said to me, she said, um, you're not turning your back on us. Um, you're not getting rid of us mm-hmm. and we're not getting rid of you. Good. And despite your new family, now we are all one big blended family. That's good. So we That's go good. where you go and they come where you come. So uh-huh. um, yeah. That's great. Really, That's really great. made a difference. <clears throat> yeah. I, I did have those fears too. And uh, they really smoothed it out and made, because mm-hmm. I had those degrees of separation too. I mean, finding out people I played basketball with were first cousins, you know. Mm. Wow. <laughs> but five, five years later, you know, uh, so... Uh, but I was concerned, yeah, I wonder how, you know, are they going to feel like, you know, but, you know, it's something that you have to know. Uh, yeah. As far as at least knowing, uh, mm-hmm. and I got a chance to meet my birth parents mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, uh, and have sort of a relationship with them, but it wasn't something, but I knew who my my, my family was. Uh, mm-hmm. The people who raised me and I've been around me all my life and my right. birth was my birth family. Mm-hmm. And so it, it became, <laughs> and you, you'll be surprised how accommodating it's gonna be and how much of a weight is gonna be lifted off your shoulders when you actually meet them and feel the love that's coming from them. Mm-hmm. And I truly believe that. I mean, I think, I mean, the one thing I would say to anyone that's considering adoption, just always be honest with that child, mm-hmm. you know? Um, yeah, well, that's, it's, that's what I say it, now too. Unless it's something that will keep you from, you know, it's it's a danger to that child to know or, or to be in that kind of environment. Right. But, uh, let them know as soon as you can. Uh, uh, I think back in, I think most parents do that now. I think back in the day, it was just something that, um, in case it was more of a protection thing because it was such a a, a strange environment that I came from. Well, you know, I, and I have friends that have adopted um, and uh, some of them have not told their children that they're adopted. And I, you know, for me, I, I always encourage them to tell them because you would rather them hear it from their adopted parents than to hear it from to the your point of, mm-hmm. you know, that somebody just, you know, blurted out or um, I have a, a cousin um, that was adopted and we used to joke about it when we were growing up. Um, she, her parents thought that she didn't know. And she was like, I always knew. I just wasn't going to. But, you know, it bothered her that they would not tell her, you know. Um, so I would say, be honest with them. And it, it's something special to be chosen, mm-hmm. you know, versus mm-hmm. so. And, and that's the story that all adoptees should know is that you were mm-hmm. chosen. You were chosen. You know? mm-hmm. so, and the most important thing uh, for me, for my daughter to know, and uh, mm-hmm. as far as when down to health, you know, especially me being a, you know, it kind of explained me being a, a, a heart patient, that uh, later mm-hmm. on I found that the, that, that kind of history was all in my birth family. Mm-hmm. Uh, but wow. uh, early before then, the doctor asked me, I couldn't, you couldn't uh, say. was it mm-hmm. this in your well, I really don't know. Mm-hmm. And when I found out, I knew, and then, then I could pass that on to my daughter so she can be 
or what or what's in her bloodline as far mm-hmm. as health. So well, that, that's important. very important of mm-hmm. knowing. Yeah. Uh, um, it is frustrating when you don't know your history because I remember being pregnant with with my my oldest one, and the doctor asking that question. Well, what's your medical history? And you know, you stop and you think, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that was the first time that I had an overwhelming pull to find my my story. Um, mm-hmm. 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 Um, and I can remember breaking down in the doctor's office because I just didn't know. And that was the first time I'd ever really thought about it. You know? um, it's so important. It is. It is. So well, uh, I, I think, go ahead. Uh, you know, it, it extends from uh, back in the day with the closed adoption system where you didn't tell. And then uh, parents wanted to protect the child also. Mm-hmm and mm-hmm. uh, to close off the, that past information. And, but now we're sort of have an open adoption system now that we, we, we want to let the child know when they can handle it. That's the other key, mm-hmm. when they can mm-hmm. handle the information. <clears throat> and, then, uh, so, and then we go on from there. Because <clears throat> mm-hmm. there are some, even in the Korean adoptee community, they don't want to know. They, they have no desire to find their birth families, mm-hmm. you know, so... Um, to your point, they they know they're adopted, but you know they're they're okay. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I don't know if that's out of fear or just that they're just complacent with where they are. So right, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I can understand that too. And and one last thing was my father being an attorney. That's what he did. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he had front line, huh? Yeah. yeah. He you know, people's ad- adoptions, and uh, so he knew exactly what to do. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, um, and the military, the military is very close too, because uh, of course the military mediated ours, mediated mine, and same thing. It's very, very, very tight. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> well, Tracy, I, I want to thank you again for uh, sharing your story with us. Uh, as emotional it was for you, we, we noticed you know, uh, throughout the interview, certain things, you know, uh, certain issues that we talked about uh, touch you. And uh, like I always say, it, it's therapeutic mm-hmm. and it is. to talk about it. it is. At the same time, you might help someone else talk about it or feel a little bit more relief. Uh, you know, because adoption is a good thing and, and it shouldn't that be a, a good thing. Mm-hmm. That's a burden on us. But mm-hmm. To know is to lift that burden in many exactly. cases. We only know, only us know what we're going through. The, the adoptees know what we're going through, uh, even though it might look like uh, everything is okay. Mm-hmm. But in the back of our minds, you know, once we know, we have to know more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're right. Um, I, you know, and when I was in Korea, someone said to me, they said, you know, no one will ever know your, your trauma or your journey. Um, and at the same time as adoptees, we have to have compassion for those that have never lived a day of adoption. Exactly. Um, and I, that stuck with me coming back. I thought, okay, that gives me a different perspective on how to respond to others mm-hmm. that ask about being adopted, that ask, um, is we do, we have that double you know, some people like you and I, we have that double duty, you mm-hmm. know, where we have to not only um, take care of our own burden, but we have to be compassionate about what that means for others. Mm-hmm. Um, but Indeed. I really yeah. thank you so much for this opportunity. It was very therapeutic. The more I talk about it, the easier it gets. Um, yeah. I'm really looking forward to meeting my family uh, uh, this week. Um, I really look forward to seeing my family in Virginia in mm-hmm. a couple of days. And so then I will be calling you so that we can all kind of get together. We'll have a union, a Virginia union mini reunion mm-hmm. in Portsmouth. Mm-hmm. How about that? <laughs> and when you learn to make that kimchi, we will have a reunion. Okay. <laughs> I got you. I got you, girl. <laughs> So, oh, oh, let me see you. It's, it's called Hampton Roads now. It's no longer Tidewater. Oh, no. right. thank you. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, thank the you. Last time she was here, it was Tidewater, and 
we used to get that a lot at Union. Uh, y'all from, mm -hmm. y'all, you know, Tidewater? <laughs> Tidewater, yeah. <laughs> the Hampton Roads. Okay, I do remember that. Sorry. Yeah. No, that's so. quite a place. Still, I, I still use it every once in a while. It, yeah, I do, too. I, I do, do, too. I do, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it was a pleasure talking to all of you. Um, <laughs> Thank you. And I'll try to... Pleasure with you as well. Yes. Got it. Pleasure. And keep keep us informed of how everything goes, uh, uh, if you if you like to. And uh, I will give our regards to your D DNAs. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Yeah, I don't think two and three were going to tune in. It's way too early uh, for them to tune in. And number uh, uh, well, I'm sorry, one and two was too early for them. And number three, of course, is on set. So yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, anyway, it'll be on YouTube later, so they can watch okay. in or, or on Facebook Live. You got it. Thank yeah. you guys so much. All Any right. Comments from the host. If not, we can. Uh, okay. I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you, and I'm sure that you were able to give some consolation to many people out there who are listening. <laughs> who may needed to have heard those words that you shared with us on today. So I thank you so very much uh, for being here, Tracy. And I thank you for sharing with us. And I look forward to talking with you again. And the you last thing it. I My have, pleasure. Last thing I must say, people in, in Virginia, please don't sit on your laurels and think that all is well. We need you to get out there and vote tomorrow. Vote like mm -hmm. your life depends on it. You got people want to ban Toni Morrison's book. You got people want to do all kinds of crazy things and want to take us like Texas and Florida. Get out and vote on tomorrow. Every vote counts. We had a situation in Virginia where the, the vote was so tight they had to pull the name out of a jar for the person who won. So every vote is crucial. Please, please. And don't forget your local candidates because they make the decisions about your life on a daily basis. So make sure that you get out there and you cast that ballot on tomorrow. That's my last word on Coffee Talk today. Yes, yes. please. Yeah. Uh, and vote like those people voted in California. <laughs> yes, yes, let's do like yeah. California. Let's fool them all. Let's yeah, fool them. That's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah, my last word would be, uh, Tracy, uh, as you fill in the blanks from your, from your history, uh, keep uh, thinking about how you're going to re uh, fill in the blanks for uh, your 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 future, and keep moving on. Mm -hmm. And I'll echo echo what Leah said. And I'll add one point: your life does depend on your vote. It does, because uh, being a black man in the South, we're headed to the where where. If I have a light bulb out driving my car, mm -hmm. I may mm -hmm. not make it home. And we have a candidate for governor that wants to go back to those days. Amen. Mm -hmm. He is uh, trying to soften his language. And that's uh, Mr. Yunkin. Mm -hmm. But he is, uh, you might as well put a hood on him. The day after he's elected, you can put the hood back on. Mm -hmm. And that's my opinion. Mm -hmm. And uh, you don't want those type of folks in office tomorrow. Exactly. And you can keep them out. Mm -hmm. So don't, don't come out on Wednesday and try to protest talking about what, what you could have, should have. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's my point. Right. That's right. <clears throat> okay, thank you. We can always depend on the colonel for those political... Uh... <laughs> Yes, commentaries, and uh, uh, of course, we appreciate it here on on for some coffee talk. Yes, we That's do. The the diversity diversity of our hosts, mm -hmm. different, yeah. and it's our opinion. Keep yes. that in mind. <laughs> okay, Tracy, take care and uh, get some rest because I know that that clock, that internal clock, is kind of thrown off. You know, uh, <laughs> California time, West Coast time, on the East Coast. So uh, get some rest. And uh, we look forward to uh, hearing from you in Tidewater. Thank you. Yes, Thank yes. you so much. Thank you. So do you, we, have, we have another session with you where you tell us about your journey from this point on. So 
we're looking forward to hearing Absolutely. about it, okay? <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you all. Thank you. God okay. bless. Thank you. God yeah. bless. Bye. Thank Bye. you. <laughs> and you forgot, James? Portsmouth oh, Coffee Talk? Yeah. Portsmouth Coffee Talk is here for our voice. Our community. And our future. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Tracy. Thank you so very up. much. Thank you. You're very well. Thank you. My pleasure. Bye. Okay. Bye bye. Let me stop this recording. Yeah, you go.